it was an age of dire struggle when faith, loyalty, and basic survival could be challenged at any time. Alliances had to be formed, sometimes born of honor and courage, and at other times of greed and fear. Often, conditions would make it seem impossible to know the difference. They were the secret brotherhoods founded with the Crusades 1,000 years ago. There were three orders of God soldiers. The Knights of St. John, the Knights Templars, and the Teutonic Knights. They were the appointed guardians of the true faith, sworn to protect Christendom against all enemies of the cross. They went to war in the name of Christ, building empires, amassing fortunes, destroying enemies, real and imagined, and changing the course of human history forever. Generations of knights dedicated to charity in the name of our Lord the poor were tainted by bloodshed and betrayal in the pursuit of political power. Their legacy is a tale of idealism, corruption, and redemption that crisscrosses the centuries and the world's great turning points. From the fall of the Ottoman Empire to the American War of Independence, from the Napoleonic Wars to the rise of Nazism and the fall of the Soviet Empire. These are the Brotherhoods, still making history today. The Knights of St. John, the oldest of the Brotherhoods, was founded as a Hospitaller Order to care for the poor and the sick who visited the Holy Land during the Crusades. They owe their existence to a group of adventurous merchants from Amalfi in Italy and to a religious frenzy that swept Europe in the year 1000. Jerusalem was thought to be the navel of the world. Whoever walked where Jesus had walked would have all of his sins forgiven and would sit beside him on Judgment Day. When a French noblewoman brought the purported thumb of St. John the Baptist back to Maurienne, most of the town traveled to Damascus to see his embalmed head. The relics of Christianity were thought to be imbued with supernatural power and in the Holy Land, one could see the spear of Longinus that had perforated the chest of Jesus, the crown of thorns, and maybe even touch the true cross on which Christ had died. Whole embassies would make dangerous journeys in the hope of securing a drop of the Holy Blood, a fragment of the true cross, or teeth, nails, and bones of saints, prophets, and martyrs to be housed in the churches of Europe. The Muslim occupation of Christian territories, such as Syria, Palestine, and Spain, had gone on for almost four centuries. Muhammad had preached respect for all faiths. Muslim rulers were tolerant and did not desecrate the holy shrines. However, Turkish tribes started impinging upon the Fatimids of Syria, believing that the Christians were helping the Turks. The Fatimid Caliph Al-Hakim began persecuting Christians. This was the excuse that the Pope needed to launch a crusade. Christian relics were no longer accessible. The birthplace of Christ had to be rescued. Perhaps the hidden reason was the threat of Islamic culture and its relentless expansion. The Muslim world had flourishing trade along the great caravan routes, stretching from India to Spain. Cities like Baghdad, Damascus, and Aleppo were bigger than Rome, Paris, or London. 
and were great centers of culture and learning. In 1054, the papacy had lost control of the Eastern Church of Constantinople, the capital of Byzantium. Byzantium was thriving, while wars and bad harvests had been ravaging Europe for several decades. On November 27, 1095, Pope Urban II rallied the kings of Europe at Clermont in France. The Turks, a race of people alien to God, has taken over the land of the Christians. What a disgrace if a race so degenerate and despicable should prevail upon our Christian people. If you want to save your souls, cast off instantly as Knights of Christ and go forward to the Holy Land. This was a society of true believers living daily on the edge of disaster. Faith was the only hope. War was now a religious service. And dying in Jerusalem would guarantee immediate entry to heaven. Hordes of people gripped by religious fervor marched to Jerusalem. The merchants of Amalfi, a shipbuilding town in southern Italy, had been venturing east, bringing spices and silk back to Europe. The opportunity to ferry pilgrims to the Holy Land meant they could collect the passage and open new trade with the Muslim world. They quickly built new fleets, and soon they had the exclusive franchise for the transport of pilgrims and troops. The expedition was an immense movement of men across Europe. It is estimated that between 60 and 100,000 people joined the First Crusade in 1096. Three years later, after many wars against local armies, defection, starvation and disease, the ragged crusading armies reached Jerusalem. On Friday, July 8, 1099, a solemn procession wound round the path that surrounded the city. The priests and bishops of the crusade came first, bearing the cross and the holy relics, the holy lance and the arm bone of St. George. The princes and the knights followed, then the foot soldiers and pilgrims. After several cycles of fasting, prayers, masses and marches, the city fell to the crusaders. Ibn al athir an Arab chronicler of the time, reported on the atrocities committed by the Franks, as all the crusaders reported. The population of the holy city was put to the sword, and the Franks spent a week massacring Muslims. They killed more than 70,000 people in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Ibn al kalanisi another historian, noted, Many people were killed. The Jews had gathered in their synagogue, and the Franks burned them alive. May peace be upon them. With their newly acquired wealth, the Amalfitan merchants built a hostel and hospital with 2,000 beds. It was the first and largest building of this kind in the world. The merchants, the nobles, and the monks committed to taking up arms in the defense of the hospital and the roads in Palestine. The new order of hospitallers was born, uniting the military and the monastic ideals. In 1113, Pope Pascal issued a bull, an official proclamation, establishing the order of the Knights of St. John, soldiers of Christ, as a military order and the eight-pointed cross of the town of Amalfi became their symbol. The massacre of Jerusalem had spurred Islam to a new level of fanaticism. The prophet had said, the sword is the key to heaven and to hell. The armies of Islam regrouped and led damaging attacks on the fragile Christian kingdom. The rulers of the Latin state, 
divided by internal conflict, knew the difficulty of monitoring such a long battle line. Their survival was constantly threatened, and the only force that could be relied upon was the elite core of the Hospitallers. They were given the castle of Beth Giblin. Then, five more castles in the north, which included Croc de Chevalier. By 1168, the knights controlled 20 castles scattered from Turkey to Egypt. The director of the hospital had become, by this time, a soldier and administrator, and the title of Grand Master was born. The lay confrères adapted very quickly to the military life and began to fortify Acre in the north where the Grand Master, Raymond de Couille, built another impressive hospital, then expanded the reach of the order in Europe, soliciting and receiving grants and more donations of land. Another military order was born at this time, the Templars, which quickly became a strong military power in the East. The Templars and the Hospitallers marched in battle together, flanking the cross, but competition between them turned into animosity, sometimes escalating into local battles. An attempt to conquer Egypt created a bitter dispute between them. The Templars refused to participate, and the Hospitallers had to retreat from the Caliph of Damascus, who came to the rescue and occupied Egypt. This had the unexpected result of unifying the Muslim world and providing the cohesive front that would prove lethal to the Crusaders. When power passed to Saladin, the fate of the Latin states was sealed. Saladin, a fierce and brilliant warrior, took advantage of the internal conflicts among Christians and mounted a series of deadly attacks which culminated in the Battle of Hattin. In the wide open valley of Hattin, from where there was no escape, Saladin's greatly superior forces met and slaughtered the Christian armies. Almost all the Templars and Hospitallers were killed. And Jerusalem again fell to Muslim hands. By this time, there were so many captured Christians that in 1187, the price of a Christian slave in Damascus was less than a pair of shoes. The remaining knights escaped to the castle of Margat in the north. Acre became the new capital. Richard the Lionhearted launched the Third Crusade, and the knights expanded their hospital and fortifications, establishing a double line of walls, building Acre into a large and massively fortified city. The clashes between the orders continued. The Templars, who stood by the landowner's side, and the Hospitallers, who stood by the Pope and the monarchies, kept fighting against each other in local wars for political control of Acre. When they finally signed a truce and agreed to join forces in 1258, it was too late. In 1289, the town of Tripoli was destroyed. Acre would be next. In April 1291, the Egyptian forces started the siege of Acre. The Christians knew they were doomed. A month later, the overwhelming forces of the Sultan breached through the walls, weakened by the minds of the attackers. Thousands of Christians were buried under the collapsing walls. Only seven knights came out alive. This was all that was left of the Hospitaller Order. The Crusaders could not have survived 200 years without the reinvention of the medieval castle. A few hundred knights had to defend hundreds of miles of territory. 
They poured decades of warfare experience and engineering inventions into building the most efficient war machines. They produced stone fortresses that seemed impregnable and became the model for castle building for the next 300 years. Croc de Chevalier, in the words of T.E. Lawrence, was probably the most admirable castle in the world. As soon as they were given the castle, they began adding and upgrading fortifications. Towers, originally square, were transformed into round ones to reduce vulnerability to arrows. The entrance to the castle was the most ingenious military design. The ramps are a series of sharp bends so that the attacker had no visibility. The ceilings had narrow slits to shower the advancing army with arrows and boiling water, and gates hidden in the ceiling would drop to trap the attackers. Croc de Chevalier, a self-contained city, could be manned by 60 knights with a garrison of up to 2,000 men. It had an impressive chapel, a large 90-foot dining hall and sumptuous accommodations. It could stock food for a five-year defense. Sultan Bibars knew it would be almost impossible to take for him. He mounted massive campaigns against all the minor castles, which fell one by one under the onslaught of superior and determined forces. Then he turned all of his might onto Korak. The castle, defended by only 200 soldiers, was so well designed that every time the Muslim forces broke through a defense, the knights were able to retreat into other fortifications. Only a ruse by Bibars, who sent a note with the forged signature of the Grand Master ordering surrender, caused the knights to give up the fight. The headquarters were then moved to Margat, this castle was built on the coast and was therefore accessible from the sea, even if the standard routes were blocked. Margot, defended by only 200 men, repelled the siege for over a month, but capitulated to an army of 10,000. In 1292, the surviving knights escaped to their headquarters in Cyprus. After so many painful defeats and the loss of the Holy Land, confidence in the knight's usefulness was shaken. Philip the Fair of France had borrowed heavily from the Templars in order to finance his war against England. Unable to pay back his debts, he ordered their arrest, accused them of heresy, and in 1307, burned most of them at the stake. Other royal houses were eyeing the immense estates of the Hospitallers. Only the protection of the Pope would spare them from a similar fate. Their holdings in Europe remained safe, and the sugar refinery in Cyprus, which supplied most of the sugar to Europe, kept enhancing their wealth. Without a mainland foundation, the exiled hospitalers were forced to take to the sea. They started building galleys and a fleet. With its budding naval resources, the order helped Genoese merchants take the island of Rhodes from the Turks. The fact that this island off the Turkish coast had great strategic importance did not escape Grand Master Villaré. By occupying it, he made Rhodes the frontier outpost for the Western powers. And the order appeared as the only military organization that could revive the idea of the Crusades. The Pope promptly transferred all of the Templars' properties in Europe to the Hospitallers, who had their final revenge against their longtime competitors. Grand Master Fulk de Villaré gained the official endorsement of the Christian kings and consolidated all of the newly gained properties in Europe. 
After 19 years in Cyprus, Rhodes became the capital of the order. Villare initiated an ambitious building plan that spared no expense. The Grand Master built an ornate palace for himself. and an expansive new hospital. The idea of the auberge, a separate residence for each nationality, was born in Rhodes. The knights from Provence, Auvergne, France, Spain, Italy, England, and Germany had all formed independent groups by nationality, known as the tongues, and each tongue now had their own lavish quarters. The power, independence, and earthly pursuits of the knights were becoming so pervasive that even their supreme ally, the Pope, was disturbed. Pope Clement complained to Villaret that the knights' lifestyle was far too lavish. You ride beautiful fine horses feast on exquisite meats, wear magnificent apparel, drink from goblets of gold and silver, and keep falcons and hounds for the chase. But the attitude of the knights remained carefree and defiant. Rhodes became one of the most fortified cities in the world. The independent towers scattered along the city walls were an invention of the knights. Roads so close to Turkey served the effective purpose of monitoring and holding mainland forces at bay. This was infuriating to Mohammed II, who had conquered Constantinople and extended its empire from Venice to the Russian border. The small island of Rhodes was blocking vital trade between Egypt and Turkey, an unacceptable problem for a mighty empire. The first siege of Rhodes began in 1480. 600 well-adapted knights resisted the onslaught of Mohammed II, and as the Grand Master Obusson was pierced by a spear, the knights overran the Turks, who retreated. The euphoria of victory and the expectation of renewed attacks sent the knights into a building frenzy. Technology was quickly changing. Bronze cannon with deadly smaller balls had made iron cannons obsolete, and this required new types of fortifications. Walls had to be doubled in thickness to an astonishing 40 feet. Suleiman the new Turkish ruler started the second siege in 1522. Martinengo, a legendary military engineer, had built miles of tunnels under the city walls and equipped them with ingenious underground listening devices with bells that would alert the knights to detonate explosives at a distance. Suleiman continued the siege through winter, finally breaking the defenses but was so impressed by the knight's fighting stamina that he allowed them to leave. Later, Suleiman would deeply regret this generosity. The knights sailed out again, searching for a mission. At the beginning of the 16th century, Spain, which had consolidated its empire with the union of Castile and Aragon and the conquest of Granada, was the only Christian kingdom capable of stopping the Turkish advance. Charles V, King of Spain, needed a buffer against the advancing armies of the Sultan. After the fall of Rhodes, the knights were very wealthy, but homeless, 
and the royal houses of France, England, and Portugal were again eyeing their riches. In 1530, the Grand Master Lille d'Adon quickly accepted Charles V's offer of the island of Malta as the Knights' headquarters in exchange for one falcon a year. They could not move in fast enough. Their first task was to turn Malta very quickly into a secure outpost that could withstand any attack. Grand Master Homedes fortified Castel Sant'Angelo, turning it into a massively defended fortress. Fort St. Elmo was built at the end of the Shibaras Peninsula. A chain weighing several tons was ordered from Venice to be stretched across the harbor, cutting off the entrance. North Africa was in Muslim hands and was dominated by the Barbary Coast Corsairs, headed by Shadadin, also known as Barbarossa. The Barbary Corsairs were the scourge of the Mediterranean Sea. Dutch and English pirates had taught them the use of the Berton, a heavily armed and very fast ship. Sailing out of Tunis, Algiers, and Tripoli, they attacked European ships, stripped them, and took the passengers as slaves. Algiers was a renowned city of 100,000, larger than Genoa and Marseille, and one-fourth of its inhabitants were Christian captives. Spain and the Knights engaged in furious battles all along the African coast, edging close to Maltese waters. When Barbarossa retired, Dragut, an even fiercer warrior, took over. Dragut occupied one of the Maltese islands, Gozo, and took its inhabitants as slaves defiantly brutalizing his captives in clear view of the neighboring Maltese. Jean de La Valette was elected Grand Master in 1557, the same year the Spanish fleet was crushed in Gerba in the worst defeat of the century. In 1565, Suleiman Encouraged by the success at Gerba and Dragut's easy conquest of Gozo, sent a huge fleet with 40,000 men from Constantinople, heading straight for Malta. When the knights were alerted, they begged Philip of Spain for 25,000 troops. But everyone knew that it would take three months to amass such forces, and they would arrive far too late. 1,000 men would be sent from Sicily, and that would be all. The Knights knew that they had to hold out until the arrival of the Spanish army, if it ever came. The Turks, on the other hand, knew that the siege had to be victorious in one season, before any possibility of reinforcements. It was going to be a test of endurance and a bluffing game. Lavalette concentrated most of his forces on St. Elmo, which guarded the harbor's entrance. The Turks would want to take St. Elmo first. If it fell, the Knights would have little left to fight for. The attack came from the south, then the west. St. Elmo was practically surrounded. On June 23rd, a major offensive was unleashed. Out of 260 defenders, 200 were dead at the end of the day. But St. Elmo did not fall. Mustafa Pasha, the Turkish commander who expected an easy victory, took the bodies of dead knights, had them nailed to crosses, and floated them toward the Grand Harbor for the population to see. In response, Lavalette had the heads of the Turkish prisoners cut off and shot from cannons into the Turkish lines. St. Elmo did fall, 
but it had drained the Turkish forces and weakened their resolve. The Turks now crossed the harbor to attack Castel Saint Angelo. But the Knights had planted underwater stakes throughout the harbor, which sank the Turkish ships and slowed down the attack. The military forces of the Knights were down to 600 men and were unable to resist for more than a few days. Miraculously, the Spanish fleet, under Admiral Garcia de Toledo, sailed into the harbor the night of September 7th. In the morning, the Turks awoke to a fresh invading army of 8,000. The Sultan's army retreated in disarray. After four months of one of the most massive military operations of the times, the Ottomans had been defeated. The year 1565 brought the order instant fame. The news of the Maltese exploits traveled all over Europe. 541 Knights Hospitaller, aided by a garrison of some 9,000 men at arms, had repelled the repeated assaults of between 30 and 40,000 attackers. The moral significance of the event was enormous. A small group of men had stopped the westward push of the mighty Ottoman Empire. Voltaire, 200 years later, would write, Nothing in the world is better known than the Siege of Malta. All European kings now clearly understood the importance of this small island to the economies of Europe. The royal courts began sending money to Malta to strengthen its fortifications and the Pope sent his military advisor, Laparelli, to create a new fortified city. In 1566, Valletta's first stone was laid down. Valletta was built on a grid pattern so that an approaching enemy could be seen from all sides through the intersecting streets. It was conceived as a model Renaissance town, the first one in the world. All houses came with a water tank and a sewer, and all the facades were designed by an architect according to the city plan. Valletta became one of the finest examples of urban architecture in the world, the model town visited by scores of Europeans who came to admire its futuristic design and to affirm their allegiance with the powerful order. Six years later, in 1571, the Order's fleet, together with warships from Austria, Italy, and Spain, won a decisive victory at the naval battle of Lepanto, effectively shattering Turkish maritime power in the Mediterranean. The Battle of Lepanto shifted control of the Mediterranean from the Turkish fleets to Christian ships, and the Spanish kingdom was free to concentrate on northern Europe. The reports of valor at Lepanto made the knights legendary figures. The standard bearer, Herrera, dropped the flag only when he was nearly sliced in half, losing his arm and all of his shoulder, and survived to tell the story. Hundreds of young noblemen flocked to the order in search of glory and adventure. Malta became a busy and freewheeling city the Grand Master Cassier asked the Pope to appoint an inquisitor to stem Protestant ideas, but also very likely to slow down the debauchery in Valletta. The Church of St. John was embellished with the help of some of the best sculptors and painters of the time. Knights were buried under the inlaid marble floors and the Grand Masters built ornate tombs to themselves to impress posterity. The Grand Masters Palace in Valletta was a princely residence that rivaled the best in Europe. The Tongues also built their great palaces. The Tongue of Provence, the Tongue of Aragon, and the Tongue of Italy vied with one another in building larger and more sumptuous mansions.
By the beginning of the 17th century, Malta had become a great economy built on the public works of the order, including the military fortifications, the great hospitals, and a complex administrative and legal system. The development of a larger and more powerful fleet, however, made the Corso, the privateering against Muslim ships and towns, by far the biggest source of revenue for two centuries. From the earliest days, the Hospitallers had a strong link to the sea. From the earliest ships called Dromons that ferried pilgrims to Jerusalem, they developed the galleys, the warfare ships that fought the Muslim ships a century later. The loss of the Holy Land forced them to trade the horse for the ship and to rely on a fleet as the main combat weapon. The Karak, a supply ship with three to four masts, was being used to supply the galleys which conducted the attacks. Turkish galleys were taken over with their crew intact, and once the knight's flag was hoisted, they were ready to attack other Turkish ships. By the middle of the 15th century, so many Turks were captive that most of the rowers on the knight's galleys were Turkish slaves making compulsory military service among the Christian forces obsolete. The Navy of the Religion, as it was called, was the most formidable fleet of the time. The order commissioned the largest ship in the world from a Nice shipyard. The Santa Ana boasted a metal bottom and gun decks with 50 cannons. This unsurpassed galley was soon copied by France as the model for their fleet. By the 18th century, the order provided the premier naval academy for all the major European fleets, including France, the Papal States, and Russia. And Catherine the Great commissioned the knight Giulio Lita to create a fleet for the Baltic. To fight the Barbary Corsairs, the order, under papal approval, instituted the Corso. The Corso was a private enterprise like no other. Entrepreneurs acquired letters of mark, which entitled them to sail under the flag of the order, attack any Muslim ship, confiscate it and its contents, and take the sailors as slaves, all under the protection of the church. An international code stipulated the percentages of the spoils. The victor received 11%, the Grand Master 10%, all the way down to 1% designated to the nuns of St. Ursula. The order maintained a large fleet with a low overhead by having the captains bear the cost of running the ship. To maintain a galley cost 20,000 scudi, a huge sum in the 16th century. But the rewards were very high, and it was the quickest way to advance in the order. This policy also assured that every captain would attack as often as he could. When the Maltese were made aware of the great trade caravans sailing between Constantinople and Alexandria in the 1660s, 30 ships with 4,000 knights and soldiers plied Turkish waters, wreaking havoc and prompting a contemporary Turk to ask, is Malta more powerful than France? The Corso was state piracy, designed to break the competitor's monopoly. The far-reaching effect of the Knights Corso was to shift the Ottoman trade into the hands of the European powers, thus accelerating the economic decline of the Ottomans. France, thanks to Malta, had acquired the Levantine trade, and Spain, the North African trade. By this time, with a much weaker enemy to fight, the Order's fleet grew slack and undisciplined. After the French conquest of Malta and the disappearance of the Knights, the Barbary Regencies gained strength 
and under the pirate Yusuf Karamanli, operating out of Tripoli, started disrupting Mediterranean trade once again. In 1803, England, France, and even the United States were brought into battle with an enemy that the order had kept in check for two years. The primary task of the order was always the care of the poor and the sick. Blessed Gerard, the rector of the Amalfitan hostel in Jerusalem, had called for service in the name of our Lord the poor. The hospital, the largest in the world with 2,000 beds, provided services previously unheard of. Theodoric, a doctor from Salerno, wrote in 1172, No one can tell another how beautiful the hospital buildings are how abundantly supplied with beds and rooms, how rich in refreshing the poor. And we saw that the beds numbered more than 1,000. Not even the most powerful king could maintain as many people as that house does in one day. Medical sciences benefited from the famed school of Salerno near Amalfi, but Arabic influence was also felt, especially through the advanced Syrian schools, which introduced medicinal syrups to Europe. When Saladin conquered Jerusalem, he allowed the hospital to remain open for almost one year in order to have the sick taken care of. Wherever they went, the Hospitallers were renowned caretakers. In Cyprus, at Lemesos. In Rhodes, in the Street of the Knights. And in Malta. They built hospitals of such comfort and luxury that many Europeans struggled to be admitted. A French patient reports, they poured wine into silver goblets for each patient there, and the food was served on beautiful silver plates. The beds are like a little tent, soft and very fine. Besides luxury, this implied a knowledge of the antiseptic qualities of silver. Their involvement with warfare stimulated constant improvements of surgical procedures. The Maltese doctors had the reputation of conducting the fastest amputations in Europe, being able to cut a limb in under two minutes. The knight's achievement was to have combined loving service to the poor with exceptional service to its sick soldiers. This tactful doctrine enhanced the order's status while also guaranteeing a loyal military through the ages. In the 18th century, the power of the Knights of Malta reached its peak. The Grand Master status rose to that of a prince with his own court, living with the pomp of royalty. A live orchestra accompanied lunch and dinner. Young knights played females and sang the roles of the sopranos in the opera house built by the order. And the sound of music and theater slowly replaced the sounds of cannons. A courtly household of 40 supervised and managed the activities in the various Grand Master's palaces, and 50 horses were hitched to his carriage. Taste and breeding became the most valued traits. Rivalries among the knights played according to their nationalities. The watches of the French knights kept Versailles time, even though it was an hour earlier in Paris and they always dressed in black, ridiculing the colorful outfits of the Spaniards. While the Italians made sure their swords were longer than anybody else's. The French Revolution inflicted a heavy blow to the order. The knights were closely identified with the royal house. And when they lent Louis XVI 12,000 francs in 1796 to help his escape, they sealed their fate. After his capture, the king was imprisoned in the Knights Temple in Paris, and shortly after, the entire properties of the order, 
valued at five million pounds, were confiscated. On June 6, 1798, Napoleon and his army of 29,000 sailed into Valletta, defended by 7,000 soldiers. The odds against them were not worse than with Suleiman, and yet the island was given up without much resistance. Napoleon, a committed Freemason, had sent envoys the year before to rally knights who sympathized with the Republican cause. And Grand Master Ferdinand von Hompesch was believed to have connections to Freemason lodges in Germany. Most French knights refused to rise against the French army, as well as several Spanish knights who were ordered by their government, allied with France, not to fight. Napoleon strolled into the city on June 12, 1798. The Grand Master was allowed to leave, taking with him only the hand of St. John. Everything else, the large and uncatalogued treasures of the order from the Grand Master's palaces to the gold and silver of the churches and the relics of the Crusades, were packed and taken to Napoleon's ship, L'Oreal. Fifty French knights sailed with Napoleon, although Knight Beaujolien remarked, no situation, however desperate, can ever justify committing such dishonorable acts. In an ironic twist of fate, on August 1st, an English fleet under Admiral Nelson attacked L'Oreal, which sank with all the treasures in Aboukir Bay. Mysteriously, in spite of several international attempts, the treasure has never been recovered. The knights sought and received the protection of the Emperor of Russia, Paul I, who quickly elected himself Grand Master against the protestation of the church. The Tsar could have easily reconquered Malta. Plagued by schizophrenia, however, he chose instead to give knighthoods to all of his friends and mistresses. This enraged the frustrated knights in St. Petersburg. On March 23, 1801, four knights of Malta assassinated the Tsar in his bedchambers. By the early 1800s, England had occupied Malta, and the knights' headquarters in Italy, Russia, and Germany were closed down. The order was considered dead. The Knights settled in Rome in 1830 when they were given a home by the Pope. But under the watchful eye of the Holy Father, they traded what little freedom they had for a total dependency on Vatican rule. The only activity remaining open to the order was caring for the sick and they began appearing in all European wars of the last century, organizing field hospitals. In World War I, the order operated a hospital ship, the Regina Margarita, and hospital trains all over Europe. Keeping allegiance was always hard for the times. When Italy entered the war against Austria, the Austrian Grand Master, who had invested the order's money in German and Austrian war bonds, had to resign in shame. In 1923, the King of Italy gave the order extraterritorial status. The Knights of Malta's prestigious position as one of the last aristocratic institutions made them very attractive to a group of ambitious social climbers called i Fasuli, the fakes. William Lamb, an American of Russian descent, claimed a connection to Tsar Paul I, and therefore the right to set up his own knighthood, called Knights of Malta Incorporated, in Pennsylvania in 1911. After World War II, this corporation was still selling knighthoods all over the world at a brisk pace. A dubious character named Enrico Vigo set up a U.S. Knight Center in Malta under the name of His Imperial and Royal Highness Prince Henry II, Constantine de Vigo Lescaris, Alaramico Paleologo de Montferrat. 
hereditary emperor of Byzantium. During the 1980s, passports to the sovereign state of Malta were sold by speculators in Hong Kong to the tune of $50,000 each. Today, the order boasts 10,000 knights and 50 embassies all over the world. The Grand Master is recognized as a head of state with a rank equivalent to a prince and the ecclesiastic position of a cardinal. The order continues to run hospitals and relief assistance worldwide. It dispenses, according to some estimates, over $50 million a year in charity. In a fitting gesture, the government of Malta returned Castel Sant'Angelo to the order in 1999. Starting out once again in the Mediterranean, they once ruled with the cross and the sword. The brothers will surely find a way to thrust themselves into the history of the 21st century. Blessed Gerard founded the humble order over 900 years ago in the name of our Lord the poor. After many centuries of charity, the order of the Hospitallers has reached the new millennium with the essence of the Brotherhood untouched.